morning, everyone. Morning. How's everyone doing? Good. I'm Dr. Barmore. I'm uh, one of the fellows over at the University of Florida Movement Disorder Center. I met some of you. Um, can't hear me. Can you hear me a little bit That's better much now? Better. There yes, we go. Thank you. All right. Sure. Um, uh, sure. And um, so I'm going to be talking today to you about uh, exercise in Parkinson's disease. And we're going to talk about a few different things about the importance of exercise in general and then the importance of exercise um, in particular <coughs> Parkinson's disease. Um, Can you say your name again? Uh, Ryan Barmore. Yes, sir. Um, so, get started here. If you could shift here, you'll be able to see the screen better. Oh, yeah. Can everyone of, uh, see that okay? <laughs> I, tried to make, I tried to set it up so it would be easy enough to see, but... Um, yeah, we have plenty of seats, so feel free to scrunch. So a bit of an overview of what we're going to be talking to, about today is uh, fitness in general, uh, the importance of exercise, as I said, some, some of the special challenges in Parkinson's disease um, as regards exercising and moving in general, and then the benefits of exercise in Parkinson's disease, of course, and then we're going to sort of break down the elements of fitness um, and PD and talk a little bit about the, these different things. So just uh, a, a little definition really quickly. You're going to hear um, a few different terms um, when you're researching and learning and talking to different people about exercise and Parkinson's disease. You'll hear about exercise, you'll hear about activity in these two different terms, and, and they're technically different but really interchangeable. So activity is any sort of movement that um, increases your energy use above just your baseline level. So anytime you're using energy uh, to move or do things. And then exercise is a form of activity that's planned, it's structured, it's repetitive, and it's done for a specific reason. Um, to maintain fitness or to um, maintain or increase your functional capacity. So many factors contribute to physical fitness and we can see some of these here. So your, your cardiorespiratory endurance, your uh, muscular uh, strength and endurance as well, flexibility, agility, balance, uh, many of these things and more contribute to our physical fitness. So there's a lot of elements that go into this and the point of, of highlighting these things is that um, Everyone is going to be starting at a, different, uh, at a different point when they're first diagnosed with Parkinson's disease. And then Parkinson's will affect some of these more than others, and some of these more than others in different people and at different times during the disease. We'll talk about that a little bit more as well. So what are some of the elements of, of exercise? If we break down this big term exercise into sort of big chunks to broadly start to think about exercise. Um, there's aerobic exercise, and this is really any sort of activity that raises your heart rate, such as walking, running, cycling, swimming, that sort of thing. We'll talk about each of these in much more detail later on, but just to give a, an overall framework. Um, resistance training, so anything that makes our muscles stronger, um, such as using weights or uh, weight-bearing calisthenics, exercise bands, anything like that, anything that you have to sort of work against to exercise your muscles. Um, stretching helps our muscles and our joints move more easily to prevent um, uh, injury and to overall improve um, our ability to move. And then balance training, which improves stability, uh, may prevent falls, that sort of thing. And all of these will affect all of the others as well. But, so these are a little arbitrary, but, um, uh, but help us think about how to structure an exercise regimen. And so why is exercise important in general? This is something we, we all know to some degree and are bombarded with regularly that exercise is very important, but um, it's, it's often hard for many of us without Parkinson's disease at baseline to, to get up and move and to, to have a, a regular exercise regimen. So physical inactivity is well established as a risk factor for many chronic diseases and for overall increased mortality by a number of different means. Um, so as you can see here, cardiovascular disease, uh, diabetes, certain cancers. Um, as you can see there, obesity, high blood pressure, depression, osteoporosis, osteoarthritis, decreased cognitive function in a number of different ways. So all these things are associated with physical inactivity and, can, um, and the risk for these can be also thereby uh, uh, decreased um, with uh, an appropriate exercise regimen. So again, to emphasize that one size doesn't fit all. There are many differences between uh, folks with Parkinson's disease, as Dr. Lang 
uh, had highlighted this morning, Parkinson's is, um, is not really just one disease. Um, everybody has different flavors, and so, um, and everyone is coming um, to the disease from very different places. So everyone has different ages. Folks can be diagnosed with Parkinson's disease uh, very early on in life, in their 30s or 40s, or later on in life, uh, 50s, 60s, 70s. So um, that makes a big difference. How long you've had the disease makes a big difference, as does other health conditions. If you have underlying uh, heart or, or um, pulmonary problems or arthritis, that sort of thing. Um, the availability of equipment, of resources. Some folks will have um, the ability to, um, to have a, a very well-stocked gym right near, nearby or access to personal trainers and so on, and other folks don't. But these, the, the important thing to note here is that everyone comes from a different place, but these should not be uh, barriers to, to moving and to getting moving. Um, and then personal preferences, of course. So um, Parkinson's disease, as we talked about before, is a neurodegenerative condition. And it's progressive. Uh, it comes in with two different big categories of, of uh, symptoms and signs, motor and non-motor, just like Dr. Lang had gone through uh, before. Um, so we'll touch on those a little bit more in a minute. But um, all of these factors can lead to physical inactivity. Um, apathy is one of these big issues in, in Parkinson's disease that leads to sort of a lot of loss of motivation and drive. And these things all lead to um, uh, making it more difficult to, to get started uh, with an exercise regimen or just get moving. Our research has shown that if you take folks who are you know, at the same age and otherwise healthy and folks who are at the same age who have Parkinson's disease, folks with Parkinson's disease tend to move less just in general, to have fewer steps during the day, that sort of thing. So it's something that, um, that it's a place that you're starting from that uh, can be difficult. So a sedentary lifestyle uh, can also be a compensatory strategy in Parkinson's disease. As, as the disease goes on, folks have a higher tendency to fall. They may be worried about falling and may be um, trying to protect against that, and so they just move less. Um, so these are all some of the challenges that we need to overcome, but can absolutely overcome. Um, so, and it, as you can see here, it sort of becomes this, uh, this vicious cycle. One thing informs the other. Um, but, here are some of the, the challenges as we've talked about already. And then, you know, why are we talking about this specific to Parkinson's disease? Well, it turns out that a lot of research over many years now has found that exercise is beneficial, particularly in Parkinson's disease. It's beneficial for everybody, uh, but in addition to that, it can have... Um, have big benefits for the signs and the symptoms of Parkinson's. So um, there is sort of going back to the to uh, uh, the basic science involved in this. There's been research in animals um, that show that there's uh, some uh, degree of neuroprotection and neurorestoration um, in animal models of Parkinson's disease. So these are these are models of Parkinson's disease where we take an animal such as a mouse and we um, give it a toxin, for example, that induces um, a death of the cells that cause the signs and symptoms of Parkinson's disease. So it's a little bit different than the actual disease, but it's a good model to start to think about it. And so when folks have looked at this before, they find that, in fact, um, if you have, for example, um, exercise uh, in mice and then you give them this toxin, they tend to do better than the, than the mice who didn't exercise. And then same thing after they've gotten the toxin. So there's some evidence to suggest that it can be, um, that it can be protective. Uh, we're still working towards showing that definitively in, in humans, though. So um, exercise has symptom-modifying benefits in folks with Parkinson's disease. So while we haven't been able to definitively show, not yet at least, there's a lot of folks looking at this, that exercise slows down the progression of Parkinson's disease. We're, we haven't found definite evidence for this yet, but it certainly does help uh, the symptoms and the signs of the disease. Uh, it makes a huge difference, and we'll go through uh, some of those in particular. Outside of folks with Parkinson's, exercise helps all sorts of different things, including depression, which slow down progression of uh, certain types of uh, cognitive impairment. And so... Um, there are some, there's even been retrospective studies that have suggested 
and moderate to vigorous exercise may protect against the development of Parkinson's disease in folks in midlife. Um, these are all sort of suggestions. We're still trying to pin this down, but it's, but it's, uh, it's uh, overall a, a strong body of evidence to find that this is actually quite helpful. The, one of the most recent studies that just came out a few months ago um, was actually found that high intensity um, treadmill exercise was safe um, and what we call non-futile in folks with early Parkinson's disease. Basically what that means is um, it was better, it was, um, it, it was indeed better than, than not doing anything at all. So that sort of opens the door to do more uh, study to, to hopefully pin down this, this issue. So, besides the motor symptoms of Parkinson's disease, so uh, stiffness, also called rigidity, slowness, also called <coughs> bradykinesia, um, postural instability, tremor to some degree, uh, all these things have been found and have been uh, uh, suggested as being improved by ongoing exercise. Um, but not just the motor symptoms of Parkinson's disease, the non-motor symptoms as well. Um, so some of these things as you see here, cognitive decline, uh, depression, osteoporosis, sleep dysfunction, uh, constipation, fatigue, a lot of these things have been reported as being uh, improved by, by exercise, particularly in <laughs> folks with PD. So hopefully I'm uh, sort of edging you toward being convinced that this is a uh, a very helpful thing, particularly in folks with PD, but also how do we get started. Uh, so the first thing to do is really to talk to your primary care doctor. And the reason for this is to make sure that there are not other medical problems that would limit or modify your ability to, uh, to exercise. So there are very few things that will limit, that will absolutely limit folks from, from getting their heart rate up and, and exercising, but there are some things to be careful about. So it's always prudent to check with your primary care doctor first, make sure that your heart and lungs and so on are okay, um, and um, if you need to, you know, just modify what you're going to do going forward. And then another good step is to partner with a physical therapist. Um, you know, as they had mentioned before this talk, and, and uh, as uh, uh, Meredith DeFranco and our, one of our physical therapists will be talking this afternoon about this as well, which is really good, uh, very complimentary to what we're talking about today. Um, Working with your physical therapist is really a great home base for designing an exercise regimen uh, for folks with PD because, um, as we talked about, everybody is different. So establishing a baseline of your physical uh, status, what you can do, what you can't do, what your strengths are and what your weaknesses are, because then designing the, the program is going to help you to address those weaknesses and to focus on those in particular, um, and also to help you be safe. Um, so generally considering structuring your, or your exercise regimen around these different big categories that we talked about. Um, aerobic exercise, muscle strengthening, flexibility, and balance. And a few quick tips um, regarding this as well, and you'll, you'll hear more from, uh, from Meredith a little bit later, but exercising while in the medication on state, so when you're able to move the easiest, um, is generally a good way to go. Um, stretching first, and we'll talk about that more in just a little bit, um, is very important so that you can avoid injury, hopefully, um, and to just um, uh, allow you to enjoy the, the process of exercising more and, and to get the most out of it. Warming up is a really important thing and something that we often overlook, especially uh, when we're cramped for time. So a five to ten minute warm up is always really critical. Um, Basically, that's doing the planned activity, so walking or water aerobics or boxing or what have you, um, doing that just at a slower pace and working your way up. Um, the whole point is being gradual, getting up to the point where you're going to exercise, and then being gradual and coming down, so allow for a cool down period. Um, stretch again during cool down, and you really want to strive for full range of motion all your joints, and we're going to talk about that more in a minute. So. I know I'm going a touch fast. Any questions so far? This is sort of informal. I want you to jump in if you have any questions. But all right, so let's talk about some of these these different uh, pieces and parts. So flexibility. 
So as I said, regular stretching uh, is very important and that helps muscles and joints remain flexible. Um, it allows for greater range of motion. Um, and this is a particular issue in Parkinson's disease because rigidity or stiffness is one of the key elements of Parkinson's disease because what that means is that everybody has some baseline level of muscular tone. So all the time, even if we're sitting relaxed in a chair, we have some degree of tone. So our muscles are always contracted just a little bit. And that's what we do in the clinic when we're moving your arms around, we're moving your legs around, we're feeling for that tone. And you can feel that get better with medications and so on. But in Parkinson's disease, that baseline tone gets increased. So we get stiff and it's harder to move. Not only is it harder to move because you're slow, but it's also harder to move because the, your muscles are sort of working against you. And so we want to try to loosen those up as much as possible to, and to um, engage the muscles and the, the joints, the tendons, the ligaments to stay loose over time. Because if they don't move, then they tend to get stuck. So a common thing that we see in our, in our clinic when folks come in with a new diagnosis of Parkinson's disease or we are making the new diagnosis is that they've either seen their primary care doctor or they've seen their orthopedic surgeon or even had surgery for a shoulder that was really painful for a number of months or years um, and you know, no one could figure it out. turns out it wasn't actually the shoulder at all, but that arm wasn't swinging as much. And so range of motion is very important to prevent things from, from freezing up. So you want to try to stretch for at least 10 minutes at a time, daily if possible. I really like to encourage people to, to do stretches and, and exercises in general that will encourage full range of motion of all your joints, your arms, your legs, your, your uh, head and neck, your trunk, all of that. So holding a stretch for 10 to 30 seconds, three to four repetitions in total, remembering to breathe through this in and out. That's a, an easy thing to forget. Try to be gentle. Um, do not stretch to the point of pain. We don't want to cause any sort of injury. Um, and it's not going to help you in the long run. And then being smooth and even, no bouncing. Uh, because sort of, uh, if you're thinking about how sometimes folks will, will tend to stretch and then they bounce up and down, that can lead to tiny muscle tears. So everything smooth and even. Some of this seems sort of quite intuitive, but in the moment, we often tend to forget. So muscle strengthening. Um, increasing muscle strength is very important. Um, we want to maintain muscle mass and function as we age. In general, as all of us age, we tend to lose muscle mass. Um, and uh, um, that can happen even more so in Parkinson's disease. And it's really a use it or lose it sort of situation. So losing muscle mass if you're not uh, using them and bone density as well. So uh, working against some kind of resistance using weights or bands or just body weight. Um, that can be really helpful to preserve our muscle tone, our muscle mass, and, um, and our bone density. Now, thinking back to what we just said about flexibility and rigidity, we want to be careful not being um, too, um, over, not being overzealous with our weights, trying to stay away from really heavy weights or strong weights, um, at least at, at first, trying to be very gradual um, so that we don't cause pain or worsened rigidity. That's really what we want to, to avoid. Um, so starting low and moving slow is really the, the key here. Um, and then we'll come back to sort of the official guidelines later, but two to three days per week. We don't want to worsen stiffness. Don't exercise the same muscle groups on consecutive uh, workout days. You want to rotate things so that you give your muscles enough time to recover. Um, and you want to stop any exercise that causes pain. Seems kind of obvious, but sometimes we get into that, that mindset of pain is gain and we need to push. You just want to be nice and gradual. Remember to breathe in on the easy part, out on the hard part, and then make, again, your movements slow and even. Um, you know, trying not to move very quickly or throw things, so to speak, because that can lead to injury. So then balance and gait. You know, this is one of the the big issues in Parkinson's, as many of you know. Parkinson's leads to many gait changes, and things that were once automatic are no longer automatic. Um, so our arms tend to swing less, usually on one side of the body and then the other side. Steps become smaller, your feet fall flat instead of falling with the heel first. They just sort of slap and then they, they tend to scuff. 
your speed overall decreases, your feet get held together so you don't have as, as stable uh, a base. Your trunk tends to move less, so we tend to be a little bit more stiff. Um, something called freezing of gait can occur, and some folks know what freezing of gait is, some don't. So basically what this is, is when um, someone's starting to move or while they're moving, their feet can get glued to the ground is what folks will tend to describe. Um, uh, you try to take a step and it just seems to not, not want to move or not listen to what you're trying to tell it to do, or it'll stutter and get stuck in place. That's freezing of gait. We'll touch on that more in a mo moment. Um, Another problem in Parkinson's disease is that your ability to multitask is really um, impaired. Folks are not able to do this uh, sort of two or more things at once. So, so to speak, you can't really chew and chew gum and walk at the same time. Um, and that has important uh, uh, implications for how uh, people tend to fall. So why do falls occur? There's a lot of reasons. So we have impaired balance, uh, impaired postural reflexes. So normally, if you are suddenly knocked off balance, then you have a tendency to automatically, without thinking about it, catch yourself. And you see, um, those of you who come to the clinic know that we're always pulling you back and you fall back in this trust fall and it's really uncomfortable and, and sometimes folks will fall and sometimes they'll catch themselves, but this is what we're testing here is this natural loss of, of, uh, of balance in Parkinson's. So that's a big reason. Um, your reaction times are slowed, and your ability to, to just get your body to engage in these, um, these mechanisms that will catch you are slowed as well. Freezing can happen. Sometimes folks can't move to catch themselves because their foot um, or another part of their body gets stuck. Um, you tend to take shorter steps. You don't clear your feet off the ground as much. So you can get sort of tripping over matchsticks is something that people will sometimes uh, say so tripping is a big issue and then this relative weakness like Dr. Lang had mentioned earlier um, which is not a, a true weakness but you're not able to engage your muscles as fast uh, or to the same degree as you once were you really have to focus on it so you can get the same amount of strength um, eventually just not at the same rate um, or degree so that can all lead to this um, again this difficulty doing two more things at once um, that can really impair your ability to keep track of your environment. So um, that's important. And then low blood pressure, dizziness, these are things that can come along with Parkinson's disease. This loss of the normal ability of the body to maintain our blood pressure when we stand up, um, that can be part of the disease. That can also be part of, of uh, a medication side effects. So uh, working with your physical therapist to improve balance and to do it safely is very, very, very important. So a few quick tips, um, making your steps big, focusing on that is very important. Avoid carrying too many things while walking. Always keep at least one hand free, um, especially when we're busy, we're rushing, we have coffee, we have our phone, we have groceries, so on and so forth. You want to avoid that because um, that's going to lead to more distraction and that can uh, impair your ability to sort of catch yourself if something goes awry. Um, Stand tall, look ahead, folks, especially as the disease progresses, we tend to stare down at our feet as we walk. So you really want, you want to be aware of what's in front of you, but you also want to maintain your posture because that's another thing that gets impaired in Parkinson's over time is we tend to get into this sort of stooped posture and look down at the floor. Um, be aware of freezing and for triggers for freezing. So everybody's different. Um, freezing can come and go, but there are some things that, that folks tend to say reliably um, cause it. So coming up to a doorway, for example, narrow spaces, uh, turning around, um, being in crowds, being distracted, that sort of thing. So if freezing occurs, try not to force your way through it. Just stop, focus, and start again. Um, and uh, uh, if Meredith doesn't talk about it later today during the, uh, the PT session, uh, discussing all the different ways of breaking freezing and gait that work for you with your physical therapist is very important because there's a whole list of things um, that we can do, that you can do, um, when this does occur because unfortunately we don't have good medications uh, to, to, work, to help with freezing and gait and surgery tends not to help as well. So um, uh, techniques are really the mainstay of therapy there. And then using your assist device if you need it. So canes or walkers or what have you. I can't tell you how many times I have folks come into the clinic and 
they say, well, I've been falling a lot. Well, and they come in without their cane or walker. It's like, well, where's that? Oh, well, I left it in the car. Well, just being aware of that. Um, some, there's a lot of barriers to using your assist device. Sometimes folks just don't want to use it. They feel embarrassed by it. Um, or it's a hassle, or you're trying to carry other things, or they don't feel like they need it all the time. So um, just being aware of when you need it um, and to what degree um, that's, that's an important thing. Uh, and then keeping an eye out for when it might be time to start thinking about one. So a rule, general rule of thumb, everyone being different again, is if someone is sort of tending to hold on to things as they walk or touch things, or furniture in the wall or their spouse or that sort of thing as they're walking through the house or out and about, it might be the time to start thinking about having an assist device to, to help you. So um, let's talk a little bit more about aerobic exercise, the big one here. Um, you hear about moderate or vigorous exercise, what do these things mean? Um, there's, a, there's been a number of definitions, but broadly speaking, it's just it's sort of a way of breaking it down. Sedentary is obvious, sitting, sleeping, etc. Um, a little bit of all that right now, hopefully not. Um, uh, low exercise, light weights, casual walking, that sort of thing. There's a lot of different examples. Um, moderate activity, you know, generally speaking, a brisk walk, three to at the outside, five miles an hour. Walking uphill, cycling less than 10 miles an hour, gardening, sort of strenuous gardening, um, water aerobics, that sort of thing. And then there's high activity uh, or high intensity activity or vigorous exercise. All these things that you see here, running, jogging, hiking uphill or backpacking, swimming laps, vigorous dancing, singles tennis, that sort of thing. So just to frame that in your minds, um, a rule of thumb for moderate or vigorous aerobic activity is that you should be able to sustain conversation during your activity. Um, if you're doing more of that, if you're breathless and not really able to, to carry on a conversation, then your effort is probably going to be a little bit too high. Again, everyone will be a little bit different and folks want to challenge themselves, but generally speaking, when you're trying to, to uh, keep a nice steady effort, that's a good thing to keep in mind. Um, so just something I wanted to touch on a little bit, a little on the boring side, but good to know, is the general guidelines from the Department of Health and Human Services, also the American Heart Association and the CDC, uh, sort of what are the guidelines for everybody um, for general physical activity? What do they recommend? And so they recommend sort of what we call moderate to vigorous aerobic exercise, and it comes in a number of different forms. And the point of going through this is to show you how many different ways we can get this done. So moderate um, intensity uh, exercise, aerobic exercise for 150 minutes every week. So that kind of translates into about 30 minutes um, uh, a day, five days out of the week. Um, and muscle strengthening activities, at least two days. Or higher intensity, or a mixture of both of those. And so they sort of consider these the minimum recommendations. These are considered usually, you know, in addition to your usual routine, getting up, getting dressed, brushing your teeth, walking to the car, walking to the mailbox, that sort of thing. So you can break up these, piece, these into pieces as short as 10 minutes or so uh, at, at minimum, as long as the cumulative amount uh, reaches your goal. So it, it's hard and, you know, in our modern lives to get enough time to exercise for 30 minutes of time or more. Um, some of us have more time than others, but everybody is different. So... Um, more activity during the day is better than, than no activity is really the, the point there. But as long as you can sort of put it all together in, in, uh, in a whole cumulatively um, and you're reaching that goal of moderate to vigorous amount of activity, um, then that's what is really important is what the research has shown us. So um, in general, um, you know, some activity is better than none at these levels. So again, we may need to adjust for the unique uh, challenges posed by Parkinson's disease. So as it turns out, no particular form of activity has been shown to be best, um, either in general or in Parkinson's in particular. No two people are the same. So we don't know the dose or the intensity or the type. You know, we think of exercise kind of like a medication, and it acts like a medication. So I have folks in, in my clinic with Parkinson's disease who say, Doc, I, I exercise every day, and if I have a day that I miss it, or a morning that I miss it, I immediately feel the effects. It's like I, I missed a dose of medication. And so not everybody's quite like that, but it gives you a sense of how it, 
it really makes a big difference um, on a day-to-day -day basis. So um, really the most important thing here is finding what you're going to enjoy um, and what you're going to what you're going to continue because the best exercise is the exercise that you do. Um, you know, if uh, it's if you have a great regimen and it's and it's planned out perfectly, but you're only doing it a few times a week, uh, you're not getting around to it, or you start it and you hate it and you don't stick with it, then it's not going to do you any good. So finding something that really um, that you really enjoy, that you really like to do, is the most important thing. So that may be tennis for one person, it might be boxing for another person, it might be dancing for someone else, um, it might be running, or it might be cycling, um, that sort of thing. So finding what you like is really the most important thing, and it's never too late to start. That's another thing. Um, uh, there was actually a, a study that suggested that um, even in the very old, so folks in their mid-80s who had not been exercising at all and then started had a mortality benefit. Those are folks without Parkinson's disease, but the point is it, it applies to all of us. It's never too late to start. Um, so some movement is better than none, and that's always something I, I just want you to, if, if we take away nothing else from today, is that you know, more movement is better, uh, and some is better than none. Um, so those are some of my thoughts so far, and uh, any any questions about about that um, or anything that I can clarify? Yes, ma'am. Yes, I'm very confused. I was diagnosed with essential tremors mm -hmm. seven years ago, and um, when I did stretching exercises, then my whole body would start to tremble. Mm -hmm. And the neurologist I saw at that time said, "You must stop it immediately, mm -hmm. so that that tremor isn't laid down in your brain." Hmm. Um, another thing he said, uh, because my handwriting was really deteriorating, uh, then you'd have to take uh, some alcohol, and that will help. Mm -hmm. And um, I had, being a fallen by the wayside Scottish Presbyterian, mm -hmm. I thought, that is terrible. <laughs> uh, however, I've, I've found over the years if I want to accomplish anything, like writing checks or, or a birthday card to somebody, that I'm ab absolutely forced to take a uh, vodka tonic. <laughs> <laughs> but it troubles me uh, taking that with all these different medications because I've got so many other problems. What is, what is your advice in terms of the stretching, for example? That was the first... So that's a good, that's a very good question um, as to whether or not stretching uh, or something else that worsens your tremor is going to lead to some sort of kindling effect and further worsen. I'm not aware of anything um, uh, like that. I'd have to look into that a little bit more. It's a little unusual. Um, but I, I, I don't think that that should limit your, your stretching or your exercise. But to be perfectly frank, I'd have to look into that more. Regarding the alcohol, that's a common thing in folks with essential tremor. It's actually one of the things we look for and what we ask you if we're considering essential tremor versus some other sort of tremor. And just as a side point, all sorts of things can worsen tremor, um, such as physical activity or getting your heart rate up, being anxious, being stressed, even stretching, that sort of thing. But regarding alcohol, it's something that helps very much um, in essential tremor in particular, not in the tremor in Parkinson's disease typically. Um, but it can be a problem because it can be helpful, but I've had folks come into my clinic with what we diagnose as essential tremor, but because the, the only thing that they found before they went to the doctor was alcohol as being helpful, and they end up drinking a little bit too much over time. Um, so working with your doctor is going to be the most important thing to try and find something that works as good as the alcohol or better than it um, uh, to improve your tremor. Um, because there's a whole host of different medications that can be tried, usually in combination. Um, but uh, uh, you know, depending on the specific situation, alcohol can uh, interact with certain medications. So um, you know, it's going to be sort of person specific. So I definitely sit down and talk to your doctor about that if you haven't already. It's been very complicated yeah. because I, I really research things and I try to understand it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, certainly. And everything in moderation, a little bit of alcohol is not necessarily going to be you know, bad for everybody, but it's, it's really going to depend on, your, on the situation, the medications, and all that. 
So, uh, yes, sir. If um, exercise is important as the medications, have there been studies that said if you increase your exercise, you <coughs> Um, that's a good question. So, in general, some folks can uh, decrease their their medication uh, with um, or limit the amount of medication that they have when um, engaging in a good exercise regimen. But it's going to be a little bit of a of uh, a moving target over time because as time goes on, the disease will progress, and you will need more medication in addition to the exercise. But there's some research to suggest that it will that it. Uh, um, improves your, your symptoms uh, to a significant degree. Because for me, I, my exercise has been more important than the, than the meds. It feels like if I, if I miss two days of exercise, my body starts contracting mm -hmm. more totally. Yeah. And, and I've had a lot of folks um, you know, that have told me that, that very thing. And so everybody is going to be different. Um, but it, I think that just reinforces the importance of exercise. Um, overall, and now, so again, this is still an open question of does exercise slow the progression of Parkinson's disease? Um, and that's something that we we have a lot of evidence to suggest that it does. We we just don't know for sure yet. But either way, it helps the symptoms. So I think that's important. I'm going to ask you a question. Did you exercise previously? My exercise previously was 30 minutes to an hour of walking three four days a week. Okay. And I was diagnosed and was put on Cinemat and had wonderful reactions within two or three days. But I also told myself, and I just kind of made me more about it, but for every day I exercise, I'm going to walk another day. So I hit the gym six days a week, and it made such a difference. It was amazing. And so when I miss two days, if I travel or whatever, I really, my body just, I can just feel it starting to tighten back up. And the reason I ask that is because... We were never exercise people, mm -hmm. you know. And um, now that we're retired, while we have time to exercise, we are doing a lot of other things. Mm -hmm. You know, he's golfing four times a week, you know, and whatever, which is a good thing, but it's that other exercising we didn't do. And mm -hmm. my mom was 90 when she started exercising, so it's, there it is hope. Yeah. <laughs> like I said, it's never too late to start. <laughs> Never ever too late to start. Um, it just being just being safe, finding what's right for you. These are the the keys. You know, really the take home points that I want you all to to leave here today with. Um, yes, ma'am. I was really interested in the dance routine that they did yes. earlier with all the stretching. Mm -hmm. Has anybody thought to put together some sort of a video specifically for Parkinson's like that? That's a good question. I I think so. Right, right. <laughs> I think so. I couldn't cite any uh, specific uh, routines, but dance has been or has been uh, researched thoroughly in Parkinson's disease. Originally, it was um, uh, Argentine tango, I believe, that was that was sort of the first evidence base, as it turns out. And then since then, we've researched a lot of different types of diseases. And so the key is movement, rhythm, and it, it can get your heart rate up. It helps you uh, maintain that range of motion flexibility, balance, it incorporates all sorts of different things and also incorporates uh, learning, which is very important to challenging yourself um, in, in uh, yeah, exactly, yeah, that's exactly right. Yes, ma'am. Can I address that? I don't mean to overstep any of that. Please. We go to the dance class that they did. I don't know if you live here in Anchorage. I mean, engagement. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Okay, so... We go, and also I've been a physical therapist for 30 years, and and it's the lady who runs it is not well. Anyway, Emily, she, her movements are all geared for the extension, rotation, the things that you lose in Parkinson. So if you can attend the, the class, it, it's excellent. There is also the Power Up program, and which is based on another program that was developed by PTs, but. For that program, in order for it to be taught, you have to get, it's, a PT has to do it a very specific way in order to call it that program. And another therapist or other therapists, I think out in Arizona, they took that program and they said, no, we want everyone to benefit from this. And they changed it, and it's excellent, and we do. My husband does the exercises every day. <laughs> and it's excellent, and it addresses a lot of different things. And you can access the YouTube videos. It's called the Power Up Program. Very good. And it's, it's, um, you, it's, there's four categories of motions, and they do them in five positions. So sitting, 
And you and we don't do every position every day. So he doesn't do sitting because he doesn't. We just get sitting, but we do. He does prone and, and on hands and knees. One day and then the next day, supine, which is lying on your back and standing. So he just alternates. So he just takes ten minutes. He does it in the bedroom floor. And and those videos, the, the people who do those videos on YouTube are excellent, and they have the handouts at the movement center in the PT department. Great, thank you. Yeah. So.